Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guest this evening. Elizabeth George is the internationally best-selling author of the character-driven suspense novels featuring Scotland Yard's intrepid inspector Thomas Lindley and his unruly sidekick, Detective Sergeant Barbara Havers. A longtime instructor of creative writing, she has taught at colleges, universities, writers' retreats, and conferences globally. Her other work includes three YA novels and the popular creative writing manual, Right Away. She serves as executive chair of the Elizabeth George Foundation, which awards grants to poets, emerging playwrights, and unpublished novelists. Her many awards include the Anthony Award and the Agatha Award, and she has twice been nominated for an Edgar Award. She joins us this evening with The Punishment She Deserves, the 20th novel in the series. A reviewer for the Wall Street Journal writes, what has been said before deserves repeating. From suspense to social commentary, from violence to pathos, from villainy to possible redemption, Miss George can do it all with style. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth George to the Free Library. Well, thank you so much for coming. It is, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. This is the second to the last stop I am making on this book tour. So I am uh, pleased to be, <laughs> to be almost done, but at the same time really delighted to be able to get out and, and meet people who, uh, who read the Lindley novels. What I thought I would do is to start out with talking a little bit about how a novel like this one gets put together and then at that point answers some questions that you may have um, about the novel, about writing itself, about the series of novels, etc. So with the book, The Punishment, he, uh, the Punishment She Deserves, I began with the, uh, the, the idea of how am I going to get my police to the location that I have chosen for this book. And the location I chose was a town called Ludlow in the Midlands, right near the border uh, of, of England and Wales. I chose it because it had the kind of, what I call the stuff that I'm looking for. I like places that are really atmospheric to write my books. And Ludlow has all of the kinds of things that I find really appealing to, to deal with when I'm dealing with the setting. For example, it has an, the ruins of a, a very ancient castle that was one of the border castles to guard the what they call the marches. And this particular castle was used by the battling Plantagenets. So the Yorks used it, the Lancasters used it, and then later, after the War of Roses, the Tudors used it as well. It's the place where Edward V was as a young boy when Richard III, and, well, his uncle, the Duke of Gloucester, and the Duke of Buckingham rode to, uh, to fetch him and ultimately to take him to his death, but they didn't know that at the time, the boy himself. So, so I really liked the idea of this particular old town. If you have a copy of the book, the town is right on the cover. So you can see the, uh, in the left-hand corner, you can see the castle. In the middle, you can see the, the big steeple of St. Lawrence Church, which features in the novel as well. So this town also has 500 listed buildings. And what that means in England is that nothing can be done to change the exterior of those buildings. They have to stay as they were. Consequently, they have a slew of medieval buildings and buildings from the Regency period and from the Georgian period, et cetera. And everything is in its original condition. When you have a building like that, you can change the inside, obviously, if you own a medieval house. You want to make some, uh, what the Brits call mod cons, to put the, the mod cons in there, like things like plumbing, etc. cetera. Uh, <laughs> but the outside needs to stay exactly as it was. It needs to look like that medieval building. So you get to see that kind of stuff, too. When I get to a location, 
the first thing that I do is tromp around. My first editor called me a, a topographical gumshoe because what I'm doing is literally walking around the town as much as possible, speaking into my handheld tape recorder, taking photographs, conducting interviews, taking notes from those interviews, etc. And all the time that I'm there, I'm looking for something that's going to suggest story. What happened in this town, very interestingly, is that when I looked for the police station, which is one of the first things I do, because obviously a police station is going to figure in the novel, and if they have one, I want to see what it looks like. So I, I saw it on the map, and I went to the police station, only to discover that the police station was closed down. And what they had, instead of a person inside, was a push button outside. And the button said, if you, you know, if you push the button on the intercom, you will be connected with the emergency operator. The, we would call it 911. They call it 999. And the, uh, the appropriate officers, officers will be sent to aid you or, or something like that. Above it on the building was a CCTV camera, too. And I thought, oh, okay, that's really interesting. So we have this closed station, nobody inside. The only way to make contact with the police is by pushing, pushing this button. And then when you do all of this, you're being photographed anyway. I walked around the station and saw that in the back, there was another CCTV camera. The thing about England that really fascinates me is that there's CCTV cameras everywhere everywhere, and especially in London. When you're out on the street, if you're just there as a tourist um, and you're walking around seeing the sights, you will be photographed at least 350 times in a day because there are that many cameras, which I never can figure out why people would commit a crime in London. You know, <laughs> why? Because all they have to do is find the, you know, they get the tape of the, the CCTV camera nearest and the rest is history. But in the same thing in Ludlow, they have CCTV cameras, but not as many as they have in London. So I knew that, okay, that CCTV camera, this closed station, that intercom system, well, that's sort of interesting. But the big question for me, because I have Scotland Yard detectives, is how do I get my Scotland Yard detectives up to Ludlow? The reason I have to ask that question of myself, is that the books that I write are modern books, and it's not like the golden age of mystery, where somebody would say, call in the yard, and then uh, you know the Scotland Yard would trot out to whatever location they have. It doesn't work like that. The yard detectives are employed really differently from that, so I had to figure out, okay, how am I gonna get them involved? Well, one thing that I knew was that if a crime is committed in, if, I'm sorry, let me go backwards. If somebody dies while in police custody, that triggers an immediate investigation by the police, of course, but it also triggers what's called an IPCC investigation, and that is the Independent Police Complaints Commission. They're not they're not policemen at all. It's an independent commission, but it's the police complaints. So if you have a complaint against the police, you go to the IPCC, and if somebody dies in police custody, they have to be called in immediately. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. So what if I have a situation where somebody dies in police custody? And what if that person ostensibly has killed himself in, while in police custody? And what if that person has done this in this closed police station where there's nobody there except one officer, the PCSO, and that's the police community support officer. They have all of these initials that they use in England. So if that were to happen, what he would do, the officer who is there in, the, in this station with the person who kills himself, is that he would immediately call emergency services. They would immediately send a, uh, either a duty inspector or a full-on detective inspector. In, in the case of this book, they don't bother with the duty inspector. They send the detective inspector to the scene. She questions the, uh, the paramedics who have also been called, she questions the, uh, the uh, officer who's there, she questions the, uh, 
the doctor who has come to proclaim the dead man as actually dead. And as soon as she's done all that, then she calls the IPCC because she knows that this has to be handled by the Independent Complaints Commission. So I thought, okay, so what if they do their investigation and everybody arrives at the same conclusion that the first woman, first officer reached and that the, uh, the forensic person reaches too, which is, yes, this, this guy did, did commit suicide. And the way he commits suicide is that he is a, um, he's a deacon in the Church of England and uh, he commits suicide by using part of his vestment that he has with him. And he has that with him because when he is arrested, at, he's arrested uh, right after Evensong in the church, and the uh, officer goes to the vestry to, to arrest him, and he's just about to change out of his clothing. He does indeed change out of his clothing, but he takes with him this, uh, this particular part of the, uh, the vestment called a stole. And because he has, uh, has, has hanged himself from a doorknob, it is a very, very obvious suicide to the police when they're looking at it and to the forensic people when they come to see it as well because it would have been impossible for somebody to have killed him this particular way. But what if, after the I PCC says that, what if the father of this man obviously disagrees, he knows his son, he knows his son would never commit suicide, and there has been against the son an allegation of pedophilia, and he swears there's no way his son was a pedophile, no way. So he's a wealthy guy. He brews beer. He has a whole s series of bre breweries, like the brew pubs we have now. He has, has a series of brew pubs in England, and so he's made a great deal of money, which means that he has a certain amount of sway with his member of parliament. And I thought, okay, so what if the member of parliament goes to New Scotland Yard to the assistant commissioner of police and says, hey, we have a real problem, and the problem is this is what happened, this is what the IPCC said, and the IPCC, when they were done, did not turn the case over to the Crown prosecutors. What that means is that the IPCC decided, yes, it was a suicide, and the Crown prosecutors don't need this case because there's nothing to prosecute. The guy killed himself. So, what if, though, the father says, I want the Crown prosecutors to look into this case. And if the Crown prosecutors don't look into this case, then you guys are going to have the lawsuit of the century on your hands. And so the member of parliament trots over to New Scotland Yard and he talks to the assistant commissioner. The assistant commissioner is a man named David Hillier. And David Hillier has been, from the beginning of the series, a real political animal. That's what he is, his response to everything is to look at it from the political standpoint. What's the news coverage going to be like? Do we need to embed a reporter in this investigation? You know, how's it going to appear? How are things going to appear? And so when he learns from the member of parliament, when he hears the magic words lawsuit, he decides that, oh, oh, yeah, we will send some officers up to check this whole situation out. And so the officers that he decides to send up are Isabel Ardery and Barbara Havers. Now, Isabel Ardery and Barbara Havers are, are enemies. Isabel Ardery is the superior officer, and she has been Barbara Havers bete noir for quite some time. Deservedly so, because Barbara Havers has disobeyed orders. She's gone away without leave. She gave information to a newspaper to embarrass Scotland Yard. I mean, she's done pretty much everything to get her butt kicked off the force. But she hasn't gotten her butt kicked off the force. And what, what has happened is that Isabel has forced her to sign transfer papers. And if she steps out of line one more time, Isabel will file the transfer papers and she will be transferred to the north of England to Berwick-upon-Tweed. It's a dismal little town up there. It's the last place that Barbara Havers wants to go. So what Hillier figures is, because Hillier wants to get rid of Havers, and what he thinks is, if I put these two together, 
That's it. There's no way Havers could last a few days in the company of Isabel Ardrey. She is going to do something. But what he doesn't take into account is that Barbara Havers is also a smart woman. And she recognizes in the way she's been partnered with Isabel Ardrey that the handwriting is on the wall. And if she blows it in any way, she is uh, going to be in deep trouble. So that's a little bit of the background on the book. And so when I go, I'm looking for all these different locations. So where did the murder occur? I found it. Who else is involved? Why is this person killed? Are there any other police personnel that I need to be aware of? If this guy is a deacon, who, does he have a, uh, is there a vicar also that I need to think about? And when I'm there... I'm thinking of these things, and when I get home, what I, by the time I get home, I generally have what I call the plot kernel, and the plot kernel is the killer, the victim, and the motive in a crime. And often, as I say, when I go to England, I don't have the slightest idea of what the book is going to be about. I'm just re relying on the place itself to give me story. So I come back, I've got the killer, the victim, and the motive, and that's the plot kernel, and I use that, and I begin by peopling the world of the plot kernel, by asking myself questions about who else is involved here. You know, who are the suspects? What, what individuals are involved in, in the crime, in the solution? Who knows this guy, Ian Druitt, who, who is dead? Who knows the uh, police constable? Uh, the police community support officer who brought him into the station, et cetera. People in the world, I do it generically. So it would say uh, the victim, deacon in the church, okay, means I'm going to have a vicar, and I put his age, like 56 years old, a vagrant on the street, uh, 65 years old. Well, I just put all of these, list all of these uh, people very generically. And then the next thing I do is name them all. So I can see that I've got, all, I've got to come up with 17 names for characters. And what I always have to remember is that names are very, very important in Great Britain because they immediately trigger certain uh, pieces of knowledge, especially in the British reader. If you don't believe me, just consider this one thing. Because we name very differently in the United States. Who cares what your name is? Nobody cares that you get a name. That's it. Big deal. But they care a lot because the name reveals social class. It reveals money, or or and not. It could reveal, It wouldn't reveal lack of money. It could reveal money. It would reveal um, aristocracy. It would reveal the uh, the family line. I mean, it can reveal all kinds of stuff, which is why in the in the royal family. They just have a very small cup of names to draw out when they have children because there aren't that many royal names that are appropriate for use. If you don't believe me, consider that there will never be a King Kevin. <laughs> See, you know that. You, you know that. Just as King Kevin will never be married to Queen Sheila. Queen Sharon, Queen Chantel. You know, they, they are, the names are very indicative, and I always like to say the Middletons knew exactly what they were doing when they named their kids, because you have Catherine, Philippa, and James, all given these really, really um, upper-class names. So it's as, as if they always knew, and I think that they did. That was the master plan, which I think is so cool. You know, four, it's, you go when you think about it, it's so neat. Four generations from the coal mines of Wales to the throne of England in four generations, not bad. <laughs> so I'm naming my characters, and I'm keeping in mind that whole idea of what the name is going to reveal to the reader, and especially to the British reader, because they're the people I really have to worry about. Once I've named the characters, I've got them all named, I've got a list of 17 people, I know their ages, and then I engage in what is the most creative part of the entire process, and that is the creation of character. I take these characters and I become their psychiatrist, their soci social worker, their spiritual mentor, their guide, their psycho psychoanalyst, they're everything. 
And what I'm compiling is a, is a dossier that is as complete as I can possibly make it. And it would contain things, and it does contain things, that really wouldn't even be in a, in a dossier because it's the internal stuff of the character, too. So if I'm compiling a dossier on someone, I wouldn't necessarily know what is driving that person's behavior, what that person's core need is, what her agenda is, what his pathological maneuver is, like how does this person behave under stress? So I'm creating all of that. And in the creation of all of this, there's only one character who is created to do something very, very specific. Everybody else, I don't even know. I don't know who these people are until I actually start writing about them. There's one character that's created to do something specific, and that's the killer, because the killer has to be designed in such a way that this person could actually commit this particular crime. Everybody else is designed to have a life before the book opens and to have a life after the book ends so that the reader has the feeling of jumping into the story, into these people's lives that are ongoing. So I create all of those characters, all 17 of them, day after day after day. And I try to do two a day. I can't do any more than two. This is like, way my brain just goes. So I create these, two char these 17 characters. And then I have to make my decision of where is the story going to start, the, the book? Is it going to start at the beginning, before the beginning, or after the beginning? The beginning of a novel is that which upsets the status quo, which means in a crime novel, the murder, the killing, the death, that upsets the status quo. So sometimes the way I begin is right at the beginning. For example, in my book, Careless and Red, Lindley is walking along the, uh, the southwest coast path in Cornwall, and he sees a young man fall to his death. So that's like right at the beginning of the book. This particular book starts way before the beginning. And then I've had other books that start after the beginning where the person's died like three weeks ago and all of a sudden the, 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 uh, the police are involved. But this one is, is way before the beginning of the book. So I make that decision. I also look at the characters that I've created and I decide among these 17 characters, who are going to be my point of view characters? I would have maybe five points of view because I write in, I write in a style called third person shifting viewpoint. So I will look at the things that I've written about them, which are indicating to me what their subplot is going to be. And I'm looking for a subplot that is unified with the theme of the book. Because if the subplot isn't unified with the theme of the book, that subplot is just going to go clunk, clunk, clunk as you're reading. And you're going to think, well, I don't really, I don't, I don't get this. I, I, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. But if the subplot is unified, it'll all be of a piece. So I decide among all these characters, in addition to my continuing characters, who are going to be my point of view characters. Then I write their names on long pieces of paper. I take eight by 10 scratch paper, eight, eight, eight and a half by 11, excuse me. And, oh, and I um, cut it in thirds. And I put like Lindley, Havers, Isabel, uh, X, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Those are going to be my point of view characters. And then I figure out, OK, this being the case, these being my point of view characters, can I come up with the first 15 or 10, 10 or 15 scenes for the novel? And I write those on additional little pieces of paper. And I just write them as fast as I can. Discovery of the body, that's pretty easy. Calling in the police, that's pretty easy. What else is, you know, what else is gonna be happening in these first 15 scenes? Then I arrange those 15 scenes. I pick up those papers off the floor. And they are, each paper is underneath the POV character. And I start arranging them in what's called causality because each scene needs to cause another scene to occur, which means that during the course of each scene, a dramatic question has to be laid down. And it doesn't have a question mark, but it's a question that the reader begins to wonder as they're reading that scene. And that then will stimulate another scene. It'll cause another scene to occur somewhere along the lines. So then when I'm done with that, and that's the, I hate that part, that is the worst part, is coming up with these 15 scenes 
I dread it, I hate it. It is really, it's the, it is the most difficult part of the whole process. The, okay, so then I care, I've gathered them up. I've gathered them up with reference to causality. I then start writing the rough draft. Just of those 15 scenes, not of the whole novel. I don't have any idea what the whole novel is going to be, but I do know what those 15 scenes are going to be. So I begin to throw up onto the computer screen in present tense my idea of what this scene is going to look like, how it's going to be shaped, where it's going to take place, what kind of action is going to be going on, what kind of dialogue would exist, etc. So now I've got those 15 scenes all written out and it might be those 15 scenes might take 50 pages, single spaced. All right, so I've got those scenes and now I get to do the truly fun part. And the truly fun part is the actual writing. I do all of that work in advance for a couple of reasons. Reason number one is that I don't want to be sitting at my computer and be blocked. I don't want to be sitting at my computer thinking, oh my God, how would this character react? Or, oh my God, what's going to happen next? Do I bring a man with a gun into the room to shoot somebody? What will happen next? So having all this information, all this preliminary information, obviates the necessity of my sitting there trying to dream up something because it's already been dreamed up. And that then allows me to have fun with the writing. It allows me to do what I love best, which is using language to mold sentences in such a way that the reader is propelled through the story. You see, one of my editors said to me once, no one will ever accuse you of writing a fast-paced novel. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. No one would ever accuse me. And yet, and yet, people say to me, my God, you know, I, I read this book in, in three days or two days, and it was like 700 pages long. And the reason that the reader is able to do that has, I, well, I like to think it has to do with because they're interested in what's going to happen to the characters, but it also has to do with the fact that each sentence is carefully constructed to propel the reader into the next sentence. And every paragraph is constructed in a way to propel the reader into the next paragraph. And then every scene is constructed in a way to propel you into the next scene. And all of that is really deliberate. It's not just, you know, it's not just throwing words on the page. It's a very deliberate act on my part to make sure that I have something that's going to keep the reader reading. And, uh, and without really knowing why they're reading. When I'm done with the rough draft, what I do is I sit there and read the rough draft. It's all, it's all printed up. I print as I go, uh, like, a, like a chapter at a time. And then I read it. And I decide, based on my reading of it, what do I need to do in my second draft? And so I'll write myself an editorial letter telling myself what I need to do in the second draft. One of the things I always have to do is cut stuff because I tend to be rather wordy and, uh, and I add things that don't necessarily need to be added. So my second draft, I'm looking to cut about 100 pages out usually. And, and then when I've got all of that done, then I print it up and I read what I have. In the past, that draft, which is now the, uh, the completed second draft, goes to my cold reader. And my cold reader then weighs in on what she thinks. And then based on her thoughts and my thoughts, I, I generate a third draft. This book, I wasn't able to do that because the time was really closing in on me as far as when, the book, when I agreed to have the book in. But I wasn't satisfied with it because I had made some critical errors that I, that I knew that I had made. And so I actually had to end up writing five drafts of the book to, uh, to get it to the point where, yeah, I think it's ready to go to my editor. And that took a huge amount of time because it was, it was so complicated. And to give you an example of one of the things that I did that I recognized was, was going to have to, would, would result in the restructuring of the entire novel, is that I had, um, I had done something that I call put the reader in the wrong part of the wave. And this is what I mean. If you consider the plot of the novel, a wave that's building and breaking, where the writer wants the reader to be is behind the wave, swimming as fast as they can to catch up. If the reader is on top of the wave, that's okay. 
that means that the reader and the detectives are finding things out at the exact same time and reaching the same conclusions. Not, that's not a problem. But the last place you ever want the reader to be is in front of the wave, which means that the reader, they already know the plot, they figured this whole thing out. And what happened when I was, when I was doing my first draft of this book is I got to one scene, and as soon as I finished the scene, you know, write the last sentence of the scene, I knew right then that, I had, uh, that the whole book would have to be restructured. Because I knew with that scene, the reader had way too much information and I had put the reader in the wrong part of the wave. They were in front now. And they knew, it, it, so they knew a, a critical piece of information that the detectives weren't gonna find out till like way back here. And the only solution for that was to restructure the entire novel and take everything that led up to that moment and move it to another part of the book. And that meant that I had to actually create two parts to this novel, so there's, there's so that's what you'll see. You'll see part one, and part one is Isabel Ardry and Barbara Havers in Ludlow, and part two is Lindley and Havers being sent back to Ludlow because of something not that Barbara Havers does, but that Lindley does, and for which Barbara, for which Isabel thinks that she's finally going to be able to fire Barbara, but as Lindley says, she doesn't even know what you're talking about. And so then he's in trouble, and Hillier says, the two of you, you have like eight days to sort this out. And if you don't, heads are definitely going to be rolling, and it's going to be two heads rolling. Anyway, so that is, uh, that's sort of how one of these novels gets put together. It's this really kind of Byzantine process, and it's something that I've developed over time. Every writer develops a process. Some writer's process is to write the entire novel and then start all over again and just you know, write it and see what they come up with. And yeah, that's perfectly legitimate. I don't like to do it that way because I'm really, really strongly left brain. So what I have to do is I have to trick the right side of my brain into believing that there's order that's been imposed upon the chaos of creating a novel. And that's why I do all of that stuff. So my left side of my brain goes, oh, isn't this nice? Look at the tabs that she's creating, you know. She's going through and highlighting stuff. And you know, so, so I can then, uh, so I've appeased myself, and, and I do it because it works for me and because I hate doing revisions for my editor. And so if I need to get the book as perfect as I can get it before I send it to the editor because I hate to do revisions. I, so no editor of mine has ever seen my first draft. I would no more, no more send an editor my first draft than, than would I you know, run around naked in public. I just, I just, I just wouldn't do that. They, they've, never seen, they've never seen a rough draft. Uh, this is the first time I heard you. So I would like to know how you decided upon uh, D.I. Lingley and uh, Sergeant Haver's background and personality. Oh, okay, how I decided on their background. Well, let me do Lindley first. Lindley's background, it's just going to be so embarrassing to tell you this. I am so shallow. <laughs> Lindley's background is, comes from the fact that I just thought it would so, be so cool to have a character that had a comma in his name. Okay? We don't get commas unless you're a junior or a senior. They get commas all the time. And so I, you know how you have George Gordon, comma, Lord Byron. So that's what I wanted. I wanted Thomas Lindley, comma, Lord something. So then I had to figure out, okay, if I'm going to have Thomas Lindley, comma, Lord, whatever, and I chose Asherton because it just sounded cool, then what does he have to be to have a comma, Lord Asherton? The only, the only person that I knew who had a comma and then was Lord somebody was Anthony Armstrong Jones, comma, Lord Snowden. And I knew he was the Earl of Snowden. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll make him an Earl. So I made him the eighth Earl of Asherton because it just sounded mellifluous. So then I figured, well, if he is an earl, he has to have a family pile somewhere. They always had the family pile out in the countryside. And so I had been at that, this was a long time ago, and uh, I had been an, such a fan of Poldark. Now we have the new Poldark, but I saw the old Poldark and the new Poldark. Love Poldark. And I thought, oh, okay, Poldark, he lives in Cornwall. 
Lindley and live in Cornwall, no problem. Okay, got that taken care of. That's where the family pile is. And then I thought, well, okay, so now, where did he go to school? Well, he's a lord. I think he probably would have gone to Eton and probably went to Oxford after that. Well, that's cool. I've got that taken care of. Now he's got to have a place to live in London because he can't be commuting from Cornwall. So I thought, where can he live in London? Well, I knew where the Bellamy's lived, in upstairs, downstairs. <laughs> they lived in Eaton Square. So I went over to England, trotted over to Eaton Square, and saw these mansions that were just mind-boggling. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. He, he can't possibly live in one of these. That's just like way, way too outrageous. So I just moved him a few streets over into a, uh, into a townhouse on um, Eaton Terrace instead. And so then I thought, well, what is he going to do? What kind of car is he going to drive? Well, let's see. Well, the problem was I didn't know any British cars. The only one I knew, I knew, well, like MG, and so I knew that. And then I also knew um, Rolls Royce. But I thought, you know, he can't be driving around a Rolls Royce. Oh, I know. I'll have him drive around in this car called a Bentley. Because I didn't know that a Bentley was a Rolls Royce with a B on the front. So. So having done that, then it took me like, I can't even tell you how many books it took me to come up with a way to destroy the Bentley, but it took a long time. In the meantime, he was you know, driving this boat around London. And so I was sort of hoping people wouldn't really realize what a, you know, how big a Bentley was or how, how expensive. So, um, so then, the first two books that I wrote, Lindley was not the main character. The first two books, the first book was never published. The second book was published as my fourth novel when, when I rewrote it. But the first two, the first two books were uh, in the hands, the crime was in the hands of my forensic scientist, Simon St. James, because he was going to be my main character. And after two books in, in his hands, I thought, well, I got this guy from Scotland Yard, Lindley, so uh, maybe I should see if he can solve a crime. So I thought, well, if he's going to solve a crime, he needs to have a partner that he can talk the crime over with. So I thought, well, who's his partner going to be? Oh, I know. Let's have his partner, his polar opposite in all possible ways, because that will make for some interesting conflict between them. And that was how Barbara Havers was created. Whatever he is, she's the opposite. So he went to Oxford. She probably left school when she was 16. He has this uh, beautiful townhouse. She lives in this, uh, in this very, very unusual place now. It's a former gardening shed uh, in behind this house in uh, in in Chalk Farm. You know, he drives a Bentley. She drives this Mini Co Mini Cooper that is, I mean, the old kind that is on its last legs, coughing and groaning along. So he, she's, you know, he dresses beautifully. She dresses the way she dresses, like a slob. And that was how I came up with him. But what I wanted to do with those two characters was address an, an issue that that I firmly believe in. That that I wanted to do a series in. Which which these two totally opposite people, um, starting off at odds with each other, come to love each other, but not in a sexual way. That they uh, they're absolutely devoted to each other. They would you know go to the gallows for each other, but it is not it's not a sexual love. It's just the love between two people who've come to understand each other. So that was sort of how they came about. It's a lengthy answer. Sorry. I'm Thank fine. you so much for being here, and I want to just say that your books have given me really hours of pleasure. Thank you. Really. Um, I want to talk about um, Thomas Lindley's great loss, mm -hmm. but I don't know how detailed I should be because maybe somebody tonight is just going to start your whole series and <laughs> doesn't need to know about that. I don't know. Anyway, I just wanted to know, did, did you agonize over that? Um, I agonized over it when I read it, <laughs> so I'm just wondering what your process was. Sure. Um, Thank you. When you're writing a, uh, a, a series, what you have to do is to make sure that you continue to open up the story of the characters and not close down the story of the characters. So, so what had happened in, in Lindley's life is that his story had started to close down because he had you know, successfully pursued and wed this, this woman that he didn't even know in the very beginning of the series that he was really even in love with. And it took a while for all of that to happen because he made some big mistakes along the way. 
but f it finally happened about seven books, I think seven or eight books into the series. Deception on His Mind is the book where he has just he's just gotten married, and he's not in that book because that's the wedding weekend, and and he and his wife go off somewhere. But because his story started closing down, the question is, how do I open his story back up? And there are two ways to do that. Either you eliminate a character or you bring in a new character. Bringing in a new character at that point would mean that Lindley, uh, Lindley or perhaps his wife would have an affair with someone and would have this kind of thing going on on the side. The only problem with that is Lindley is such a man of honor, there is like no way he would ever do that, so that didn't work. So that meant the character had to be eliminated. Did I agonize over it? No, I didn't. I knew that it had to be done. It was an artistic decision. But having made that decision, though, this then was what was in front of me. If a writer asks you to share in some way the lives of the characters that you're writing about, then what that means is that you're asking the, the reader to feel something, not necessarily feel everything that that character is feeling, but to feel at least in some degree something of what that character feels. So that meant that this particular, that what happened, which was so incredibly devastating, not only to him, but also to Simon St. James and to Deborah St. James, who innocently happened to be there, that was incredibly devastating to them. That meant that the reader had to feel at least in some part some kind of, some kind of grief or, de or devastation. So when I started hearing from people who were really uh, upset and angry and how dare you do this and I'll never read another one of your books again. And so I, and when I got a three-page letter from an attorney, believe it or not, who has never... <laughs> But then, see, what I knew, I didn't laugh about it, but what I knew is it had been a success. Because if people had read it and just, you know, threw the book over their shoulder, went to the refrigerator and made a bologna sandwich, that would have been a, it would have been a failure. The fact that readers reacted really strongly told me that was exactly, it was exactly right. It, they needed to be affected by it. And the way it happened was, has become more and more common in London, with people just, I am getting blown away for no reason whatsoever. Are you happy with the PBS uh, series? <clears throat> um, because I sure am. <laughs> Did you say you are? Oh, yes. Oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> Um, you know what the BBC decided to do when they uh, when they made the books into into a television series was they decided to reduce them down to just the crime, and so um, the the books usually uh, will provide a much larger reading experience for someone because there are all of these subplots, lots and lots of characters, and all of these subplots that relate in some way to the theme of the novel, and when the BBC made the decision to reduce it to the crime, they, um, they were sort of eliminating a, a much bigger experience that the viewer could have had if the viewer got to see all of these other characters. You know, I mean, we only we see Winston and Cotta like very briefly, sort of like off to the side. And he's a, he's a pretty big character in the books. And, and we don't see Simon and Deborah at all after the first, uh, the first one that they made. So I, uh, I was a little, I was disappointed um, but my main thing was that I, want, I was hoping that the series would be good enough to bring more people to the novels, that people would see the book in the store and think, oh, let, let me read this. And I knew that if they read the books, that they would like the books. That they, if they liked the series, they would like the books more, even more, because that it's a much bigger experience for the reader. I read a book recently that I had to go and research the author because it was set in the United States. It was a mystery, but from the inflection and expressions, I could tell that the, the author was not of American origin or had not lived in this country a long time. I'm fascinated by your ability to really capture the English not just the language, but the nuance and the expression and the thought, the ways in which uh, Brits are so different from Americans. Mm -hmm. and, and if you could talk about that, I, I think that's one of the most fascinating things about your books. Well, thank you. The, um, yeah, the, the thing about the books is that you, uh, I, I really do work hard to make them, and make them authentic, as authentic as I can possibly make them. Obviously, I will make, 
make some mistakes. I'm hoping that none of them are hugely glaring mistakes. Usually it's some kind of linguistic thing. It's almost always a preposition. They use prepositions totally different from how we use prepositions. So, so sometimes it's something like that or leaving out a preposition. They don't look out a window, they look out of a window. Now th things like that that are really subtle. Um, language is, uh, is not as difficult for me because I have read so many British novels. I uh, watch so much British television and I have about five different British sl slang thesauruses or is it thesauri um, <laughs> that I that I that I use generally when I get to a certain point I'll know if the word I'm about to use is not used in England I'll I'll, I'll think you know I'll type it and I'll go you know what I'm sure that they don't use that word and uh, so, sure enough, you know, I'll look it up in my British dictionary, and it will not, you know, it either won't be there, or it'll say American, and then I'll know that I need to uh, <laughs> consult another another one of my dictionaries because I also have a British Eng American. English, I mean, I'm sorry, American English, British English dictionary where you, you look things up and you can see what they would have called it. So I have two of those, as a matter of fact. So all of this stuff together makes it, I make it as authentic as I can. And then the things that I miss, my British editor picks up on. And it's usually some, some language thing, you know, some, some expression. It's different now from, the, from in the very beginning when I wrote books, because in the beginning there was no internet, there was no YouTube, there was no 24-hour uh, news. And so you, there was a bigger separation in language between our two countries. I can remember one time that I wrote um, uh, something about, it was making, making her crazy. And uh, uh, my editor told me, that, no, we would never say that. That's not a British expression. Driving her mad, but not making her crazy. <laughs> But now, now you see making her crazy. And that's because it's, the borders between our languages have become much more porous than they used to be. I've been trying to fashion a question for the last two or three weeks since I knew I was coming. I'm a writer from uh, Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, read all up to the last two books. And I'm in the, I try to finish a banquet of consequences before tonight, but I didn't. But um, I've been emotionally tied up in your books, and I've never had that experience. Isn't that in cool, any though? Book. Yeah, and I've gone through P.D. James and Ruth Rendell and Agatha Christie, you know, and you, but I'm not a crime person. It's just like your books get to me, and when you eliminated that character, when I read it last fall, it was on vacation, and it was like somebody in my family died, and my wife yeah. was really upset that I was upset, <laughs> and... I couldn't deal with it. But anyway, so I can't give you a question to but what I'm going to tell you, but two weeks ago, when uh, Ardery had uh, Lindley on the carpet in her office uh, about what Barbara had been doing, and came to a page, and, and she said, Thomas, is there anything else that, you're, that I should know? And then he said, no. And I was in my room, and I yelled, I slammed the book shut, and I said, no, no, and my wife ran in, wondering what had happened, and I'm going, oh, God, it was so real, I was so caught up in the situation, and I literally said to her, I'm, I just have to stop reading this for a little minute, let me see what's going on with North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know if there's a question there other than, you know, because you're doing your best and you're fashioning. It's very interesting what you, I'm exhausted by some of what you said already tonight. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I just want to tell you that I had that connection to you and in these books and congratulations and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That means so much to me. I really, really appreciate that because that's the, you know, that is the, uh, the way that I want people to feel, because when I read books, that's how I want to feel. I want a connection with the characters. And, you know, sometimes I, I have it and sometimes I don't. And so that was why when, uh, you know, there's a moment in the, in, in the book where, where the character dies, there's, uh, there's this really, for me, a really, really wonderful, wonderful moment, and it's an exchange. Between, uh, between Lindley and his mother. And, uh, and she says to him, of all my children, you were always the one who was hardest on himself. 
what I want you to know is whatever you decide, you are equal to this moment. And I just thought, oh my God, what a wonderful thing to say. You know, that she was, that she was so supportive of him. You know, was my mom would have said, now you should have thought of this, you know. <laughs> But I, I, so, and that's the part when I was writing it that, that I cried at was when his mother said that to him. And it was such a statement of her love and support for him. And they had had a very, very uh, rocky relationship for about 16 years. So they had re repaired that relationship. And the fact that she was, you know, immediately there for him as, as all the family flew in from different quarters of the world before the end of the book or before he did what he had to do. Um, so that, that was said a lot to me. But I really, thank you so much. Um, are you done with the book yet? Are you um, uh, taking a... Oh, so you're, okay, Banquet of Con... Okay, okay. So, um, well, I hope you enjoy uh, the new book when you, when you get to it. You mentioned that Hillier is very political. And it seems to be in many British detective novels, the bosses, the superintendents, the commissioners are extremely, they're, they're all political gits. In your research, is this true? That they're political? Yeah, I think that they pretty much have to be because the, um, because the, the British newspapers, are, and particularly the tabloids, are so brutal. And so they have to be aware at all times of you know what they're doing and how they're projecting themselves and how the police are reacting and and projecting themselves which is why when barbara becomes in uh in the book that takes place in italy where she's a, a snout for the police and she gives them inside information about what was what's going on because she wants to force the yard to send up somebody over there um, that's why they react the way they do, because she makes Scotland Yard look bad, and the, their job at the higher ups, the administration, is to make Scotland Yard look good. And they have a whole press department that, that does that too. So yeah, it's a pretty much a political job. Um, I'm most impressed with your knowledge of England. Um, I'm wondering, did you ever live there in order to gain the sort of day-to-day -day knowledge that you need to have about just life you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And why did you decide to set these books in England in the first place, when they could have been in Philadelphia or, or anywhere okay, else? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never lived in England. Um, the most I've ever been there is uh, seven weeks at one time. But other than that, I uh, have made frequent visits to England ever since 1966, which is the very first time I went over there. Um, the second part of your question was why England instead of someplace else. You know, the funny thing is I never really considered setting my um, books anyplace else. I had been teaching a class called the, the Mystery Novel, or the Mystery Story, at, when I was a teacher at El Toro High School. And a great deal of it had to do with deconstructing mysteries and crime stories to figure out how they were put together. To do that, I used Dorothy L. Sayers uh, essay, The History of the Mystery, History of the Mystery Story, I think, or just the mystery story, I can't remember. But that's how I uh, came to, de to decide that, you know, I think I can write one of these books myself. And having made that decision, you know what, it didn't even occur to me to set it in the United States, in part because I didn't read a great deal of American crime fiction. All my reading had been in British fiction and all my reading had been in the Golden Age of mystery, which is all, all of the great female writers like Agatha Christie, Nio Marsh, Marjorie Allingham. As a matter of fact, and this is very embarrassing to admit, so, so much of my reading had been in British mysteries and in the old British mysteries that in my very first attempt at a mystery, um, at, the end, at the end of the book, I'm embarrassed to tell you, at the end of the book, um, when Simon St. James knows who the guilty party is, he takes them all into the library. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the book actually got read in, in New York by an editor at Charles Scribner's Sons, and she wrote, she wrote the nicest letter to me. She said, you're a very good writer, but if you're going to write these kinds of novels, you might want to read a few, <laughs> because they're not written this way any longer. So I thought, oh, okay, well, that's not a bad idea. So, so I decided to read a few uh, modern crime novels and then and then changed my, my approach at that point. I am actually a newbie. Uh, at the urging of my friend Carl, who uh, just spoke, I have started reading, and I actually am in the middle of a novel in the middle of the series, so I have to say. Um, 
I guess my question is, though, having heard about you know the 20 novels and the way your characters unfold, I just was fa I'm just fascinated to um, to know whether at this point Lindley surprises you in any way. I mean, 20 novels is a long time to spend with a character, and I guess in order to develop that character in a way that's satisfying for yourself and readers. You need to know that character very well. Right. But at the same time, in order to have the stories be fresh, the character has to be surprising and unpredictable at times. So I'm curious as to whether. Well, I never know exactly what he's going to do in a given situation. But when he does it, it's always in character. So for example, at the end of, of this book, he, um, I certainly didn't plan for him to do what he does, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it was perfectly logical for him to do it complete, and completely in character. So the, the surprise comes from the moment where I see an opportunity and Lindley steps in to, you know, sort of to take up the reins of that opportunity and to, and to ride it. And, and because I know him really well, I know generally how he's going to react to stuff. Like, for example, in uh, uh, With No One As Witness, he and Havers interview this young man who will only speak to them if they take him to a cafe and buy him food. And when Lindley goes into this cafe, it's sort of like the nearest greasy spoon cafe to Southwark Cathedral. And uh, Lindley won't even, ch he won't even touch the menu. You know, it's just like so, it's so disgusting. And then, and, and so they're talking, and the kid orders four meals, some of which, but in the middle of it, he gets in the middle of eating spag bog, spaghetti bolognese. I mean, spag ball, spaghetti bolognese. He, that's one of the things he orders in this greasy spoon cafe. The character, and so the, the character, uh, he gets really upset at something that they ask him, and he's not going to talk to them anymore. So he quickly packs up the rest of the meal that he's ordered, starts shoving it in his pockets and everything, and then he leaves, and that leaves Lindley and Haver alone in this cafe and they discuss what this kid has said to them and while they're discussing it Barbara is uh, playing with the, uh, the the fork and the and the spaghetti and she's just playing with it and, you know they're talking and finally Lindley says to her Barbara what are you going to do with that pasta and she looks at him and she eats it and then says they need to work on their al dente <laughs> And see, that is a moment that I didn't plan at all. Did not plan, didn't know it was there. And so they, but it's in character for Barbara Havers to do that. First of all, because she'll do anything. And secondly, because she knows that will make him totally insane. <laughs> so so that's, how, that's how it works. But I was wondering at the end of the day, um, when you want to sit down with a good book, whose books do you like to read? Well, you know, I read very eclectically. Um, in, in crime, I pro my favorite my favorite author is Tana French from from Dublin. She's a brilliant writer, and um, her her most recent book, uh, The Trespasser, I thought was just extraordinary with the way she did the unreliable narrator. It's really wonderful. She's a really fine writer, but I also read um, I also read John Le Carre as soon as he has a book that comes out. Right now, I'm reading a wonderful book by a woman in Seattle that's called My Name Is Mary Sutter, and it's a Civil War novel. It's brilliant. The last novel I read was a, uh, you know, what I would call a beach read. It was really this. Uh, it was called Girl Unknown. Do you know how? Have you have you counted how many books out there have girl in the title these days? I mean, it's like they think that okay, if we just let's we'll throw girl in the title and we'll sell the book. But anyway, th um, this book I had read that uh, that Tana French really liked this author. It's a husband and wife team. So uh, so I got the book and I read it and and you know I mean it was it was what I would call a beach read or an air plain read. It was very diverting, but uh, you know, very, very fast paced. And, uh, and, it, and you know, it was interesting too. So to, so to answer, the long and short is that I just, I just read all kinds of different things. But I really would recommend My Name is Mary Sutter. The author is, her last name is Oliveira. Oliveira. And I, God, I can't think of her first name. But it's a wonderful book. Really, really excellent Civil War book. Since you've talked uh, just now about books that you, that you read and appreciate, um, 
after listening to the very careful way that you craft your plots, I'm wondering what you think about the, um, the current fashion in novel writing where the author gives you a chapter about the end of the series of events and then you get a chapter that was sort of lifted in, out of the middle of the whatever the uh, sort of flow of events is and then, and then there's a chapter, in other words, yeah, jumping around and, mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of leaving behind the arc of the story yeah. and asking you as the reader to just throw yourself into different moments in time. Uh, do you, when you teach students and they come to you with a manuscript like that or an idea like that, what do you tell them about the advisability of this, this of structuring oh. a novel in that way? Well, what I always tell my student is that the only rule is that there are no rules. And the big thing is that it has to work, whatever you're deciding that you want to do. It has to work for the reader. And I think it's important for, for writers to be able to put themselves in the place of the reader to understand how the reader is going to react to something or what they're going to believe as a result of what you've written. Um, that what you're describing sounds like a nonlinear narrative where the, uh, the person is, is you know, skipping back and forth in time. And you know, I think that that can work really well. I think it could be really intriguing. I'm trying to, you know, William Faulkner pretty much wrote all his books that way. Um, I, 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 I have done that in some of my novels as well, but it's more that I've written books that take place in two periods of time but it always says that it's two periods of time, and the and the within the uh, construction of the novel, it's a linear narrative. It's just that it's two different periods. This period is linear, and that period is also linear. I mean, that's the thing. The only rule is, does it work? And if it works, then that's great. More power to you. So I would never advise my students not to do something. But if I were reading their manuscript and it didn't work, I would tell them that. I mean, I had one student who could not, she, she always created what I call verb soup because she would, she, she couldn't get her mind around the fact that she uh, had to keep her verbs in the, uh, in the same tense and the same mood, that she couldn't just, you know, she couldn't skip around and all of a sudden decide, well, okay, this is going to be, uh, you know, this is going to be conditional, this is going to be subjunctive, this is going to be uh, present perfect, past, you know, I'm reading it, and I would just write in the margin, verb soup, and so that she would then look at it and realize, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got to, you know, choose exactly what it is that I'm going to do. So I, I think it has to do with your being able to assess how, how the reader is going to follow stuff, really. And my guess is that the, the writer and the editor pro probably felt that this approach was not going to impede the reader's understanding of what was going on in the story. If it impedes the reader's understanding, then it's sort of like, ah, what are you doing? Well, thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>